Welcome everybody. Um, I'm delighted to be chairing this evening's seminar, The Debt and Over Technique, Global Health in the Shadows of Soviet Entomology, which is going to be presented this evening by our own esteemed Anne Kelly, coming to you live from King's College London. It's a great pleasure to have you here and it's going to be a terrific event, I know. In fact, it's going to be so stimulating that the only problem we're going to have is keeping to time. I will be whipping and flogging various panellists and indeed the presenter herself just to make sure that we try and keep on time. It's an hour long event. We've suggested that Anne talk for about 20 to 25 minutes max so that each of the commentators can then provide some reflections for about five or six minutes each. And then I'd like to ask Anne to respond to them for just another five or six minutes before opening up the floor to a Q&A um, from the audience for about 15 minutes. So, um, you know, it's a pretty tight schedule, but I think we can manage that well. I just want you to know that it, of course, will be run as a webinar. So um, you will be able to, you know, put your questions in the chat and it will be possible for you to post questions at any time. And then we will take a selection of them, of them at the end. I understand there's about 200 people on this webinar, which is fantastic for Anne. So I cannot promise that every question that you pose will be answered, but I will do my very best to choose those that are not duplicative of others. Okay, so without further ado, I would like to introduce, first of all, our speaker, who's Anne Kelly, Professor of, um, well, what are you, Anne? Are you, I always say Professor of Global Health and Social Medicine, but I think, in fact, you're Professor of Anthropology, is that correct? Um, yes, I, I'm going to hold on to that. Okay, that you hang on to it. The world needs more <laughs> anthropologists. Professor of Anthropology in the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at King's College London. And then our very esteemed panel, who I'm absolutely delighted to have with us given the current circumstances, are so taxing for so many of our participants tonight. Anastasia um, Fedotova, who's a senior researcher at the St. Petersburg branch of the Institute for the History of Science and Technology of the Russian Academy of Sciences. So very welcome, warm welcome from us all, Anastasia. Joe Lyons, who's Professor of Malaria and Control and Vector Biology at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And Christos Linteris, who's Professor of Medical Anthropology at the University of St Andrews. So we're definitely a global comport here this evening. So just to um, conclude my introduction, I'd just like to say that it's probably helpful to know that this is part of the Age of Health lecture series that's being run by the department. A recording will be made available on YouTube afterwards for those of you who want to catch up or didn't get a chance to see it. Um, and as I said, please post your questions at any time and we'll attempt to take what we can at the end. So without further ado, at six minutes past eight, Anne, I'm going to hand over to you um, for your presentation. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Professor Perry, for that generous and, you know, slightly intimidating <laughs> introduction to keep to time. And really to our incredible panelists for making the time to come um, at, you know, in this, this evening slot and to you all for being here. So the presentation really follows, just to provide a bit of intellectual context, is a chapter from a book um, that I'm co-authoring with my long-suffering and wonderful partner, um, Javier Lathown, entitled Pragmatists in the Tropics, Macedo Control and Vectors of Improvement. And just, I thought it'd be worth saying just a couple words about that project. So the book begins from the fairly simple observation that the effort to control mosquitoes offers a historically deep vantage point from which to trace the past, present, and potential futures um, of global health. Now, a catalyst for the consolidation of public health as a discipline and a key vector a vet vehicle for its exportation around the world, the fight against mosquitoes and the pathogens they carry has been one of the central continuing threads in the history of modern medicine, an empirical bedrock that exposes the constituent role of the sciences a vector have played in the formation, expansion, and dismantling of empires. Within the long seam of vector control, there is a myriad, a really kind of rich trove of stories to mine. And the accounts that this book offers really focuses on the everyday socio-material circulations of mosquito research, the painstaking labors, minor gestures, technical improvisations, and proto-political innovations that tend to fall out of the general canon of global health solutions, but really showcase the dynamic set of epistemic exchanges and collaborations that make global health work, or in some cases, make it falter across many disparate contexts. 
So these stories really develop not from any deep, you know, historical um, expertise or let alone kind of knowledge of Soviet um, history, but really from the privilege of working with entomologists and vector biologists across a number of projects um, and really guided by their interests and their empirical concerns. And again, um, any fault in that kind of representation is our own, but it's really just been um, a huge privilege kind of learning, being on the ground with some of that work. So this presentation is kind of one, one of those stories. Um, it's a story of tech transfer, or really more specifically technique transfer, that took place in the early 1960s at the height of the malaria eradication campaign, global malaria eradication campaign, or GMAT. Oh, as usual, are you gonna turn the slide? All right. Um, it begins here. Um, in April 1959, the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine hosted a month-long course titled Advanced Entomological Techniques Applied to Malaria Eradication. Sponsored by the World Health Organization, the module's principal instructor was Tatiana Sergeneva Detinova, a preeminent Soviet entomologist who recently, whose recently translated work was making considerable excitement in public health circles. The focus of her lectures and laboratory practicals was a dissection technique developed by with colleagues at the Martinovsky Institute of Medical Parasitology in Tropical Medicine at Moscow that used the scarification in a mosquito ovary to assess a mosquito's age. Now, an accurate estimate of mosquito's age had until this point eluded researchers in the West for whom a more complete picture of vector biology was becoming ever more important in the wake of large-scale DDT spray campaigns undertaken in the context of global malaria eradication. So what was the technique? <laughs> so during ovulation, and I'm so glad to have Joe here who will correct me at the end of this, the thread-like net of tubes or ovarioles that make up a mosquito's ovary undergo a process of expansion and rhythmic contraction that allow a mature egg to pass down the ovarial stalk. At the end of that cycle, the ovarial shrinks back to its original side and a remnant, kind of a ghost, which is, you know, there's some beautiful language to describe this, of its swollen form remains at the site where the egg developed. Now, this particular image is of a mosquito ovarial living in Tanzania in 1962. And it's taken, it's picture taken by the great Tony Wilkes, um, who I will return to. Now, it is an incredibly powerful image for those who know how to read it. First, because it demonstrates the considerable technical capacities of the dissector, right? So exposing the scarification in this way, stringing out these dissensions in such a clear manner really is a technique that's difficult to master and it's kind of beautifully represented here. Second, it is striking because it depicts an old mosquito, one that has ovulated eight times. Um, and you can see if you kind of follow down, you see these kind of dilations or bumps which mark the passage of the follicle down the tube. Now third, because female mosquitoes require protein to ovulate, um, we know that this specimen has drawn human or some kind of blood at least eight times. So in other words, the picture not only indexes the mosquito's advanced physiological age, but also its epidemiological significance as each bite provides an additional chance of the mosquito of delivering or acquiring the parasite from a human or, human or animal host. Now this is key because the more times the mosquito has ovulated, the more susceptible it is to infection, the more infective it is um, to the human, and thus more significant is its role in malaria transmission. So for this short-lived species, this is a kind of typhoid Mary mosquito right here. Now, the public health, sorry, things, um, the public health payoff of this labor-intensive um, technique of age grading was really clear to George MacDonald the then director of the London School's Ross Institute and one of the key architects um, in the global malaria eradication campaign. And in his introduction to the Detanova's training manual, McDonald really lamented um, the dearth of research on age grading, particularly um, an absence that he found particularly glaring in light of the mathematical advances in the modeling of epidemics, a burgeoning field of malariological analysis in which he again was a leading figure. Now this is kind of a classic, this is the um, McDonald model. And it is perhaps, you know, one of the most famous and some might argue maybe infamous um, models of epidemiolo epidemiological models of our time. Um, it is kind of, has been argued as one of the most single most consequential contributions of epidemiology to international health and development. 
Essentially, the model builds upon the key observation of the temporal parameters of malaria transmission. Um, what's essential to know is that a mosquito can only transmit the disease after the parasite has gestated in the gut, multiplied into sporozoites, and migrated into the sal salivary glands, a process that takes at least a week, um, if not longer, two or three, um, a period that is actually longer than the average lifespan of a mosquito. So what this means is that malaria transmission really hinges upon a small proportion of mosquitoes that live long enough to pick up the parasite and deliver it to human hosts. So for any aging or gerontology colleagues, this is the power of women of an advanced age <laughs> in determining global health outcomes. So what McDonald did is he used those temporal parameters to estimate what he termed the basic reproductive number, you know, the RO, which as we know, and I think we're all quite familiar with now is really this kind of foundational key um, concept for modern epidemiology. Now, assuming that the age of the population was by far the most important factor in transmission, then what you wanna do is shorten the vector population's lifespan. I mean, even if you do it by a matter of days, this will have a much far reaching epidemiological impact than just reducing the numbers of mosquitoes, right? So regardless of how many bites a mosquito, or how many times someone with malaria is getting bitten by mosquitoes, if the mosquitoes aren't living long enough to transmit that, again, you are going to make, a, you're going to be able to kind of interrupt an outbreak. Now, as it happened, 1952, there was an amazing tool that could do just that kind of shortening work, and that's DDT. Um, and what McDonald's model did is he generalized DDT's power as a kind of residual insecticide to explain its miraculous impact um, public health impact, which was already evident in a number of field trials during World War II. So essentially this model, I mean, why it is such an amazing kind of um, intellectual exercise is that it made malaria doable on, at scale, right? It transformed malaria from a kind of focal disease, a disease of atmospheres, of location, into a global epidemic, right? And that kind of scaling up of malaria into a global phenomenon, also had geopolitical reverberations because malaria eradication then becomes a primary means through which the US can begin their campaign winning hearts and minds against the specter of communism. So, I mean, again, it's amazing what that kind of work can do in terms of its kind of public health legacy. So essentially that model, um, I mean, also lifted, it was a kind of epidemiological turn that lifted malaria control out of all of the kind of breeding grounds and kind of entomological territories where control had taken place and contained it within four walls, right? You, all you had to do is kind of spray the interior walls, which is where female mosquitoes would land after taking a bite and that you would be able to shorten and stop transmission in this really powerful way. Now that spatial transformation also entailed a pace to it, right? Because what became clear early, even from before its launch, was that the potency of DDT was waning. There were studies as early as 1947 that there was resistance seen in house flies, and there were already reports coming from the campaign of completely impervious mosquitoes to DDT. And in fact, I mean, this is a longer conversation, the model or kind of the idea of DDT's action was built on a lot of faulty assumptions about what was its primary chemical mode. People assumed DDT was killing mosquitoes, but it was also repelling them. So there was a much kind of more nuanced sense of what's going on. But at that point, instead of saying, oh, we need more entomological resource, there was a doubling down on eradication. And the then director of the WHO, um, Marcelino Cando, said, you know, time is of the essence. We just need to move this out fast before resistance, you know, takes hold and we need to break the tra transmission while we can. Now, there were a number of dissenting voices. Um, critically, a lot of people working in Africa, where some of the assumptions about McDonald's model really did not correspond to the biological, social, and clinical variabilities that drove endemic translation in the subcontinent. So, Really from the beginning, Africa was excluded from GMAP, but there was a push to run a series of pilot programs that would look at the potential of DDT um, spraying and kind of what would that look like. And it was in the context of those pilot programs where entomology, which a lot of that entomological research had really been obviated and excluded from the global malaria eradication, came back to have kind of interesting things to say about what was the dynamics um, of control. 
So as GMAP um, begins to kind of stall and encounter problems, again, not only with just resistance, but kind of sets, even where DDT is working, it's not interrupting transmission, there's kind of nuances that in the kind of propulsion of eradication were, were not deemed relevant. So, but at this point, um, Malaria, the WHO Malaria Division, um, there's a kind of recognition that actually maybe some entomological expertise should be brought into the committee. So this is a kind of exchange from Carlos Alvandano, the then leader of the WHO's Malaria Division, who agreed that there should be more entomologists, but of a particular kind. So he says, you know, I agree with your suggestion that, yeah, okay, there's not a lot enough entomologists on our panel, but we need entomologists who have a specific kind of expertise you know, something in malaria eradication or something, someone like Detanovo, right? Someone who actually has some entomology closely related to malaria. So what kind of expertise did Detanova have? Um, and here, um, I can step back to the Soviet um, entomolo entomological eradication program. And again, you know, the Soviet program really built um, on a really long-term and extensive engagement with malaria. Um, malaria had been one of the most important diseases in Russia. Tsarist colonial conquests in Central Asia and Southern Caucasia had unleashed rolling epidemics among settlers and displaced populations. The turn of the 19th century, over 5 million cases, and again, this is just the ones that were registered, were kind of were marked, were annually registered um, by um, public health system. The major outbreaks that followed World War II um, also made the control of the disease a priority for the newly unified Bolshevik state. So throughout the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, anti-malarial services were introduced in the districts, first where malaria was endemic and then more broadly across the Soviet republics. So following the advent of insecticides from DDT but other um, chlorinated hydrocarbons, those services were consolidated and scaled up to a nationwide program. Um, and again, Anastasia, when you come in, you can correct me, but my this is from a um, po poster from part of that campaign. And the translation that I got was, exterminate mosquito larvae. The malaria mosquito lays its testicles into the standing water or slow flowing water of overground ponds, swamps, ditches, and other bodies of water. And I, I, I love the kind of the specificity of that kind of attention because it speaks to, the kind of approach, the kind of infra logics of the um, eradication campaign, which were really built on close, on a kind of keenly worked ecological understanding of ep malaria epidemiology that really hewed closely to the vicissitudes of mosquito habits and, and, and habitats. Sergeyev, who was the architect of the Soviet, mal Soviet malaria eradication program, described the approach this way. Before evaluating the effectiveness of DDT, it is necessary to consider the question when it is best to carry out anti-malarial measures, which varies a great deal in different districts of the Soviet Union, and in order that these measures not merely stereotype, but started and finished in proper time without wasting labor or materials, a tremendous amount of work had to be done, carried out in studying the phenological dates in the life of mosquito vectors. Now, this idea of the kind of phenological dates um, speaks to an entire kind of set of theories around the life course and disease ecology upon which a lot of which, you know, had been at really a frontier of Soviet entomology. And the presumption is that the, the effectiveness of DDT is really a matter of careful and complex calibration between the timing of spray campaigns and vector life cycles, and it demanded continual highly situated and in-depth ecological surveillance of mosquito biology, physiology, habitat distribution, and transspecies interpenetration. There's kind of ideas of the, the natural needality of diseases that harbor in landscapes before they even make transmission into humans. So again, very different kind of model of what is workable, how DT is, how DT is gonna be workable in this campaign. So, a kind of key moment when the, w, the, when the Soviet Union rejoins the WHO in 1956, um, having left soon after its launch in 1948, Detanova's expertise and her kind of technique and the role of that technique in that eradication program became this kind of diplomatic, you know, um, olive branch, this kind of moment of exchange that was incredibly, that had a lot of excitement built around it. 
Um, this is Blek Lemeshev, um, the head of medical entomology department at Martinovsky Institute, really the heart and soul of USSR anti-malarial control. And he really, you know, put the potential impact of the technique in no uncertain terms, right? As far as malaria eradication is concerned, these methods will serve as a starting point in all countries for an extensive study of the age composition of mosquitoes in connection with the epidemiology of this disease. I am convinced that international cooperation in this era will lead to the further development of the study of vector biology and thus to the speeding up of global malaria eradication. So, you know, big hope, big words, right? Now, Detanova's um, lessons in London had not gone entirely well. I think, you know, out of all the 15 who attended, very few were really able to do the technique, let alone kind of see what she was seeing. So at the Soviet delegation's urging, um, further on-site visits were sponsored and Detanova was boarded on a plane in 1962 to make a tour of the continent to do on-site lessons in the kind of key malarial stations um, in Africa. And part of her brief included an entomological assessment of the WHO's flagship pilot program in Africa, the Paratoveda scheme. Now the scheme had run for four years from 1955 to 1959 and involved intensive spraying over 15,000 houses along the mountain border running between the British East African colonies in, Ken in Kenya and Tanganyika. And Tanganyika. So the idea of her work, which was proposed by McGillies, you can see him there with the, with the telltale um, pipe, was that, you know, and who actually was responsible for really flagging Detanova's work to the West because it was his translations that brought her, um, that kind of illuminated that there was this method of um, age graining. And what he proposed was a comprehensive study of the longevity and age composition of Paratovedas mosquito populations to get some indication of how the scheme was working and you know, what could happen next. Now in the back of that picture um, is Tony Wilkes, who I'll come back to later, but another kind of key figure in the story. Now again, collaboration was not straightforward. Um, Detanova arrives in 1962, actually on the eve of the Cuban Missile Crisis. There's amazing accounts after conversation with Tony of her listening on the transistor radio. And that kind of shadow um, of the kind of Cold War landscape was very much present, even in the lab, as Mick Gillies and Detanova were kind of cheek to jowl, looking in one, each one of these eyes in the mosquito, I mean, at the mosquito's body. And it, Mix, you know, writes in his memoir, reflecting back in this moment, I soon spotted that the method of examination was a lot less systematic than her published account suggested. It was an altogether more subjective affair. And when I started to do the dissection myself, I found I was much in the dark as ever. She would give me one ovary and look at the other herself. Then I would be asked <laughs> how old I thought it was. And I had to make the embarrassing reply, ya ne jeunesse, sorry, terrible Russian. I could sense the beginnings of a potentially difficult political situation. I saw myself being cast in the role of a Western scientist refusing to accept a Soviet discovery. Why else couldn't I see what was so obvious to her? Now, in the end, it was Tony who really rescued this collaboration from the politics um, of suspicion. <laughs> and Wilkes, by all account, was a real natural, right? Not only in possession of the manual dexterity needed to parse the ovarial tissues but also the visual acuity to distinguish relevant dilations from cellular debris. And it was Tony who in the end carried out the dissections and took this picture um, to build up what is believed, I think what is the only comprehensive demographic and seasonal analysis of vector survival in the immediate wake of the African pilot DDT campaign. Now that work yielded a number of really, I think interesting insights into unknown trends in vectoral capacity, but in terms of impact, I mean, essentially, and again, this is reducing, um, this is a reduction. What it showed is that the DDT sprays, which had caused populations to plummet, still left a significant number left alive at an epidemiologically dangerous age, right? So transmission would continue. So it essentially confirmed the mounting suspicion that there were some places, Africa most of all, that were really beyond the reach of the eradication campaign. Um, and again, this is Gillies reflecting on this, saying, you know, what did it all add up to? Dedicated 18 months of dissection. 
you know, most biologists would agree that to possess such a detailed picture of the life expectancy of any important insect could only be of the greatest interest. The dividends in practical terms were less impressive. No breakthrough in the control of malaria resulted and no claim could be made to have added to human happiness in the countries where they worked, a pessimistic term. Now, the global malaria eradication campaign really has cast a long shadow, um, and there are multiple ways of thinking through its failure, highly dynamic disease, inadequate tools, a poor understanding of how they work, an inflexible approach. And it, in some respects, one can think of it as a kind of founding myth of global health, like how to do something, how global health should proceed differently. But I think for me, you know, what's quite interesting looking back at this moment, um, I think helps draw attention, not necessarily to the intractability of the, the vector or the limits of the tools, but the different ways there could be misalignments between operational ambitions, kind of ideas of the disease, and the kind of specific forms of disease intelligence that might inform them. So 60 years later, another eradication campaign, um, another kind of, you know, moment, um, similar interesting set of debates and problems around the rise of resistance, around the kind of what models capture and what they don't, what kind of aspirations and hopes should be guiding programs. Um, and I just wanted to kind of flag um, an interesting kind of resonance with a recent paper by um, Jerry Colleen and colleagues, kind of mapping out, again, this kind of set of disjunctions between the kinds of entomological intelligence and research and the ways in which it can or cannot be utilized by campaigns. And he says, you know, so why are the most reported entomological data not linked to explicit species identification data? And why are insightful analytical approaches so underutilized by control programs? The simple answer is that the most exist, most of the existing global capacity for advanced analysis of malaria related data is in the wrong places predominantly located at centers of excellence in high income countries with no local malaria transmission. So again, I mean, thinking kind of of these epistemic exchanges, you know, what are the kind of geopolitical structurings of how programs and policies are imagined and how does that feed back to key sets of insights on the ground? Now, kind of excitingly, I just want to kind of flag the kind of work that's actually, I think, helping to dislodge a lot of those, th that particular kind of geography um, of knowledge and expertise. There's been some really incredible work that's going on in Tanzania and in Burkina Faso um, that is helping to kind of re, once again, turn mosquito age into a unit of global health action and knowledge. Um, there's some work around mid um, using mid spect spectroscopy and again i'm going to rely on joey here in infrared to look at kind of the how old a mosquito is by looking at its cuticle but i thought what was kind of very interesting about this recent paper that's come out sorry it's 2022 um they're talking about you know an accurate and reliable assessment of mosquito age structure is crucial still crucial for monitoring the impact of vector control interventions However, current mosquito age grading methods typically rely on 60 year old techniques based on ovary dissections that are slow, labor intensive, coarse and imprecise, and which vary between mosquito species. A method that simultaneously estimates vector species and age without relying on time consuming techniques and expensive reagents would be of great value. So I think what's exciting is the kind of research innovations that happen with the mind to what are the kind of infrastructures of, of work and labor and how these things can be more closely tied to the kind of operational work of control. How do we bring these two together? I realize I've gone on for too long. I'm just going to end um, actually with a, with a, a thank you to Joe um, who had Tony um, come in, I think on a number of occasions and do some dissection work with his classes. Um, and I just, you know, I think for me, one of the lessons to take from this um, is not kind of necessarily thinking just strictly about kind of tech transfer or building capacity. It's not simply a matter of just moving tools, um, but how problems are imagined and the ways in which that way of thinking about the problem kind of circumscribes what interventions are doable and kind of what forms of research are worthwhile. So thank you. I hope I haven't gone over too far. <laughs> You've done brilliantly, Anne. That's fantastic, actually. I found that incredibly interesting. I had many questions I wanted to ask you myself, particularly about the, you know, the technique and the dissection process and why there was so little 
um, continuity, I guess, between the two, you know, sets of practi practitioners and why there, it was proved impossible to reproduce in quite the way that had been imagined. Um, but perhaps we can return to that question in a little while. Uh, for now, I'd like to introduce Anastasia Fedotova from St. Petersburg, uh, the St. Petersburg branch of the Institute for the History of Science and Technology, um, to give her reflections on your talk this evening. So Anastasia, over to you. Thank you. Um, few, few weeks ago, uh, when Anne asked me if I would agree to comment uh, her chapter on Ditinova method, my reaction was, sure, of course, applied entomology, Russian woman in science, the distance between theoretical science and uh, practical implementation, what could be better? It's not hard to admire and to praise on Anne's work, not just choice of her topic, but the research she conducted and how she built this story deep and rich in every way and dramatic. As you read this chapter and other Anne's work, I would add, you keep in mind every meaning that millions continue to suffer from malaria and from other so-called neglected tropical diseases and hundreds of thousands die every year. But allow me to shift the discussion to probably unexpected side. Uh, there are N words in, at the first page. Tatiana Ditinova, a preeminent Soviet entomologist, that raise, that raise question who and why is considered to be an outstanding scientist, who and why receives the recognition of the, their nearest colleagues on their estates of the international scientific community whose name remains in the history of science in 20 years after the death of a scholar in 50 or 100 years on national or international scale. I googled uh, names Tatiana Ditinova and Valentina Palavodova, another Russian uh, name in, in the in N story, nothing. I googled Ditinova Ditinova's method and Palavodova's method, uh, both in Russian and English, and this search brought some result. I looked through the catalogs of large Russian libraries and found few books, titles, a couple of books for each of uh, these two women. Then I went to, to the Library of Zoological Institute, and they catalog give three tiny pieces about Ditinova. The first was in the honor of her 70, uh, 70th birthday, then to her 80th birthday, and then obituary in the mid 1990s. All these three pieces are rather formal and not very informative. I would suggest that the first steps, or more precisely, first decades of Ditinova's career were quite difficult. I would also suggest that she get the recognition among Soviet colleagues due to her trips to England and to the tropics. In these small pieces, Ditinova was called the most eminent Soviet medical entomologist, but uh, those pieces say almost nothing specific about her work in Soviet Union. They give information only about her work abroad. As for her scientific awards, her Soviet awards look, look looks rather humble when the, her international awards are much more significant. And today we learn the story told us by a British colleague, not a Russian scholar. Draw your own conclusion. Of course, I cannot say, and you cannot say, what scholar and why would receive the title of an eminent scientist in the history of science. I know well who has less likely to attract the attention of historians. You would say it a woman, I would add a specialist in applied science. Applied entomology, despite its great importance, uh, not only for economy, but also for human health, is one of these neglected topics. And I'm very glad that one of these gaps was covered 
Two Russian uh, female entomologists received the attention they deserved, and I'm grateful to Anne that she told us this rich story. Thank you so much, Anastasia. That's fantastic. And you kept very well to time as well. So thank you so much for that. Our second uh, commentator this evening is going to be uh, Christos Lenteras, who's Professor of Medical Anthropology at the University of St Andrews. Christos? Thank you, Brandon. Thank you very much. Um, I feel like I've, I've been co-traveling with Datinova and you for a few years. So it's great to see this coming together in such a fantastic um, uh, presentation. I've also read the, the chapter you sent us. And I think this is really important, not just uh, for the history of, of um, Soviet entomology and its uh, global historical importance, but uh, for something else, which you know is very close to my heart, which is the, the visual aspects of medical research, which is something that the medical humanities are slowly beginning to uh, examine more and more. And I think your, your paper, your, your presentation shows very, very clearly that um, rather than being a symptom of, say, early stages of uh, photography, suspicion of the apodictic fa uh, faculty of this form of visualization is a constitutive part of scientific photography and more specifically medical photography. So that if you like, rather than the development of, the, of, of photography leading to more and more certainty or more to more trust, it actually produces new forms of suspicion and new forms of doubt. Now within your uh, historical ethnographic moment, if you like, uh, this, I think, articulates itself in two ways or becomes entangled in two quite uh, distinct processes. One, which I know you've talked about uh, uh, elsewhere, is the direct Cold War context of this entomological photography. And it won't be well known in most audiences, but in the 50s, we have an infamous moment of uh, communist bloc entomology, which is the, um, and, and its photography which is the photographs produced in Manchuria and North China by uh, the Chinese, uh, China was by then under the Communist Party, but also by the International Committee headed by Joseph Needham, one of the leading scientists and historians at the time, uh, which uh, proved supposedly that uh, the US was waging a bacteriological warfare in the context of the Korean War, both against Korea and against the US. And to prove that, uh, both the Communist Party in China and uh, Joseph Needham used these photographs of, of, of insects as evidence of these bombs that the US or the UN uh, at the time army uh, or Air Force was dropping across North China and Korea. So, a photography of insects as uh, carriers or, or hosts or vectors of infectious diseases coming from communist sources at the time were not innocent at all and would have been immediately be perceived, you know, it's the same decade, a few years later, with great suspicion and doubt uh, given uh, that incident, which was, uh, according to all Western sources, a, pro a propaganda stunt that had no relation to reality. So this is uh, one way in which this story becomes entangled in, in the politics of uh, entomological visualization as a, a rather unusual and eccentric part of the Cold War. Uh, but there is a, another level to uh, this production of new forms of suspicion and doubt, which is, if you like, more ontological. And this has to do with what uh, Sean Michelle Smith in her work about uh, the photography of the uh, in science uh, more broadly uh, has described as the ability of photography on the one hand to render things visible, but on the other hand to create an ontological gap, if you like, um, where things uh, uh, are rendered not, not invisible so much, but uh, at the edge of sight, at, at the edge of scientific sight. So it's not that photography produces visibility and leaves something behind. It also simultaneously produces what is left behind or what is left at the edge of sight. And what is really exciting about your uh, uh, the case you are examining is, is that um, 
what is, is this missing kind of, uh, this ontological gap, if you like, is skin, right? Um, what, is, uh, what is constantly at the edge of sight is the actual skill needed to make things visible, uh, to visibilize. And this is quite, a, <laughs> quite an interesting instance of this, um, uh, which rhymes with earlier entomological problems. For example, the inability or the extreme difficulty of replicating Paul-Louis Simon's experiment with rat fleas as vectors of, of, of plague. Uh, for the very simple reason that uh, Paul Louis Simon's uh, uh, experiment, uh, as I have recently found out, was botched. So it's and then falsified in the Annales de l'Institut Pasteur. So it's very difficult to replicate a botched experiment, which is misdescribed as being successful. But uh, <laughs> there is a long uh, story there about skill and um, this um, kind of um, uh, the skill of rendering things uh, visible, or in, in this case, coupling evidence with photography, which I think is very important uh, in, in, in your work. And uh, it, it brings together visual anthropology, uh, visual history with medical anthropology and medical history. So thank you very much. Thank you, Christos, that was great. Okay, and lastly, we have Joe Lyons who, as you know, is the Professor of Malaria Control and Vector Biology at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Joe has a couple of slides, which I'm going to ask him to share. We're going to hope this works. It, it says I can't share. Okay, Joe, just hang on one second. I'm going to make you the co-host. If you can, but... It, it, Let's well, see if that works. Does that work yes, now? look. Right. The one, and I want that one. Fabulous. And I want that one, and to share. So, another photograph of Tony's, um, showing those same dilatations. I just love these photographs, and I'll I'll make another comment about photographs in a second. Um, I think just to add to the history story, I think one of the reasons why having invested so much effort into this, Tony and, and Mick Gillies, why it, it failed to, to move mountains in the way that they thought it might, was precisely because by the time they got it going a bit like this, the age of spraying, which wasn't long, uh, was already over. So, so by 1968-69, People were already talking about the end of the age of spraying and not because of any issue of, of uh, age grading, but because we had realized in 1968 that Anopheles gambi was not one species, but several. And one of those several species uh, doesn't rest inside so much. So however much we spray inside, there are some Anopheles arabiensis that we can't reach. And I mentioned that specifically because we're back there now. Here we are in 2012, realizing again that one of the reasons why we can't interrupt transmission using our new technology, the insected treated nets, is because in some places it's an Ophelis gambi, we do better there. In some places there's a mixture with an Ophelis arabiensis, which is less well suppressed by our new intervention. So, so that's one little bit of echoes from history. I wanted to agree with the person who said that story of natural nidality, the landscape epidemiology, that was the birth of landscape epidemiology uh, and needs to be honored as such. Um, again, it's a thing that we've not really picked up. We're not very good at still uh, that kind of landscape ecological epidemiology. And then uh, last point, the, oh, one more, the, the Mick Gillies, um, Derek Charlwood, who's here, knows this better than me, but Mick Gillies started as a classical entomologist with a love of mayflies. He turned into the kind of entomologist that, that uh, uh, Bruce Schwab was saying was needed, what somebody focused on entomology for malaria eradication, his chapters describing uh, the, the features of African anophelines related to that are 
remain masterworks. Those written in the 60s, those written in the 80s, they're still fabulous for just picking out the important points. Uh, but of course, he went back to Mayflies. Derek, you know better than me. And then just last point, this is about Tony. Here's Tony's image. Here's his data from 1962, 1987. This is Tony dissecting the same kinds of mosquitoes in the same location, 25 years apart. He went back to where he'd worked as a young man. He went back there 25 years later. And those other guys who you see looking young in that picture with Mick Gillies, they were still there also in the institute to which he went back, much older and bosses now, some of them, much older and technicians still, some of them. And here's the data that he produced in, in 1987, 88, uh, compared to 1962. And this is the data we produced uh, at that time, showing, confirming uh, McDonald's uh, speculations that the effect of DDT and as we showed uh, treated bed nets is largely by reducing uh, longevity and the age grading. But this is the data I really wanted to show. So Tony did those dissections. Tony classified those females into rows here. So here we've got the, the nulliparous females here, the one Paris, she's laid eggs, these ones, 1,399 of them have laid eggs once, those that have laid eggs twice, three times, four times, five times, etc. And somebody else in that same dissecting room is looking at the glands of the female mosquito while Tony looks at the ovaries, and they are classifying those same females, not the, the ones that never laid eggs at all, but those that laid eggs at least once, they're being dissected for sporozoites independently of Tony. And these are the results. And these, I think, are just magnificent in showing that actually this technique is not, as one of your, your quoted people said, an imprecise. No, this is incredibly difficult, impossible to scale up, sorry. But precise is exactly what it is. This is what shows you that the information really is in that ovary. So they look like a bunch of numbers. You've been looking at them for, for 20, 30 seconds now. Here's what they look like if you plot them properly. And plotting now, as this shows, on a log scale and the proportion sporozoite negative. So the nullipars, they can't be infected. The one Paris ones, you remember zero of those were sporozoite positive. Just three of the 1300, two Paris, sorry, the 800 to Paris uh, were sporozoite positive. And here's the proportion sporozoite positive going, proportion sporos, sporozoite negative, I do beg your pardon, going down. So here we have with every extra gonotrophic cycle, a straight line going down, because this is a log scale, that means that a constant proportion, well, oh dear, what have I done? Have you got that? Thank you. Uh, a constant proportion is being converted from negative to positive in each cycle. What does that mean? It means that two cycles ago, a constant proportion were getting infected every time. So the slope of this line is a, a way of measuring how quickly people are being, how quickly mosquitoes are being infected. So the infectiveness of people to mosquitoes. And all of that is by way of saying, look at that straight line. Look at that straight line. You can't make up numbers like that. If he was just writing down noisy numbers, no. This is measuring very precisely uh, what is happening in that ovary. And I think that uh, that is still a line worth uh pursuing and one way to pursue it i i shouldn't give it away um we want to pursue it with christos photography and 
in particular, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning analysis of 3D photographs of that ovary. Tony's skill is in taking the ovary apart to make those things visible, exactly as you said. So what if we can do that without the skill, but using the machinery and the data? Fantastic, Joe. Thank you so much. That was really, really interesting and fantastic slides and information to digest there as well. It's nice to be able to make a little bit of history, though, in the course of these seminars, because it's come to my knowledge that, in fact, that photograph that you first showed was not, um, was not taken by Tony. It was taken by Derek Charlwood himself, who is in this um, meeting this afternoon. So Derek tells me it's an Anopheles Feralti, and it comes from Medang, and he fact, in fact, he took that very photograph and generously gave it to the WHO where it became a stock photograph. So just in order to give a little bit of attribution there, I thought we would just acknowledge Derek as actually the author of that photograph um, since we happen to have him in the room. So thank you very much for- Apologies, for Derek, Derek, I am ashamed. <laughs> no problem, you won't know. I think he very generously gifted his, his authorship of that to the WHO. Okay, so that was a fantastic presentation and set of commentaries. Thank you all. We have a couple of questions that have come up in the Q&A. So I'm going to ask those um, of Anne directly now. So um, Sebastian Fonseca, Anne, what a fantastic presentation. Thanks for this. I wonder if you know of any connections of the Detanova Bechlemeshev approach with the PASB's Fred Soper's eradication model in Latin America, for instance, Brazil, or a, a rather surreptitious exchange of science across the Iron Curtain, or perhaps despite of it, despite it. Sebastian, thank you so much. And of course, you are a great expert um, in kind of the, the global health told from a social medicine perspective in Latin America. I mean, my, you know, Fred Soper appears in the kind of annals as another kind of great proponent of the mathematics of eradication, right? I mean, I think he said, you know, what can be done in one square meter can be done in two square meters. You know, what can be done in two can be done in four. There's a kind of geometrical progression. We just need to move quickly. You know, this kind of shoot first, ask questions later. I mean, there is a kind of pragmatics <laughs> of that kind of approach. Um, and again, I think there's, I mean, you wouldn't want to cut, um, draw those distinctions too fine because there is something about the kind of just the work of getting out there to find mosquitoes and to do the eradication. But in terms of the nuances of the Black Lemeshif approach to life scheme of mosquitoes, landscape ecology, I mean, that is a very different relationship between what is knowable and what is doable and how they should inform each other. Fantastic, thank you, Anne. Um, and another following question from Muhammad Omari. Do you think there's still a place for these old techniques in today's context? And oh, if so, why? Oh, that is such a great question. And of course, I defer to the real, the real experts that are, I'm just so um, grateful are on this call. I mean, I think they're, I mean, it's an interesting idea, the kind of obsolescence of a technique, you know, what is an old technique or not? And I'm gonna hand it over to Joe, but there are, I mean, this, Bron, this comes back to your question. I mean, there are people really capable. I was thinking, um, you know, Jaffet um, Kihonda, who is a senior entomologist in Ifakara, who is an amazing dissector um, of, this, of this method. It has incredible skill, right? And I think the question, I mean, there's one question about what is labor intensive and what is skill involved. But I think, you know, broadly, it really depends the kind of, you know, place of technique depends on the kind of model <laughs> of control that is going to create the context in which it can be brought out. I mean, of course, there's issues about mosquitoes who, you know, I think Anopheles gambi, again, you know, are much smaller than the kind of mosquitoes Detanova was working with, mostly in Russia. And there's kind of different, there were different issues about just the material constraints um, of doing the work. But Joe, your hand is up. I'm going to hand over to you yeah. who's much, much better about this. No, no. It, so it, it, it addresses the question a little bit, but it also the one before. And I just wanted to share this observation, which I think uh, is, is one of the things I've learned over the years, was never taught but learned. Um, and it's this, that 
when we first come across the idea of um, getting a bottle of permethrin and playing around and treating things like bed nets with it, bed nets, curtains, lots of things you could, potato sacks, whatever, uh, we thought, oh, there's just lots of opportunity here to take this technology and that core idea and adapt it locally mm. to whatever there is locally. And it's like that idea of the natural nidality, where you have to look at the local details and adapt to them. But that's not what saved 10 million lives. What saved 10 million lives was an entirely reproducible technology where you get a net. Actually, a key advance was getting the retreatment of the net put back to the factory at the beginning. So you don't even have to do that. This is just fire and forget, a huge sausage machine. You churn out, what is it now? Recently, it was the two billionth net. And that's the way you get massive coverage. So um, will that do in the long run? I think it won't. I, I think we do need those local adaptations. But as the short-term quick solution, which is already in, in 15 years, prevented 10 million deaths, um, uh, yeah, we're, we're at that tension still, as we were in, in the days of spraying. We, we blamed the standardization of spraying for its eventual limitations and collapse. There's, and this I think links to what, um, Fredros, it's so lovely to see you, not see you, but see your name <laughs> on the call about kind of translations of end to work. And, you know, again, I'm embarrassing, you know, I feel quite sheepish and I'm going to hand over to Anastasia to answer this. Um, but, you know, going back even through the WHO archives and looking at um, forms of modeling like Mashovsky, who is a Russian, you know, is the kind of McDonald's counterpart. And he had this kind of great, I mean, his interest in modeling was precisely at these moments where transmission is just enough to keep going. And he had this great line about how models can ward against pessimism if they kind of can produce the kind of granular insights about what happens right at that edge, right? And how do we proceed programmatically? Because it is at that edge, right? Where it's, how do you multiply the amount of interventions? How do we think about that kind of, that, that residualness that gets you, <laughs> that makes the difference? And that is, the, that is the huge, as far as I understand it, that is the, that is the big, you know, point, you know, how much extra investment, um, you know, Fredericks is, and his colleague Sheila have been running these master classes, and a lot of discussion has been, you know, this kind of trade off between how much extra resources have to be invested for that final mile. Um, but Anastasia, if you're still there, I would love, it would be great to hear from you about kind of the translation of Russian entomology and how you're finding it. Is it in English? Is it well represented? Uh, I, I would say that uh, applied entomology is always a local science, local practice. And uh, of course, um, when, when you have big center, like we had it in Soviet time in, in Moscow in, and in St. Petersburg, it helps a lot and uh, Russians still play as um, a communication role, for example, now I'm involved in uh, a work of it, it made uh, by um, food and agricultural organization, as well as uh, our agricultural ministry. Uh, we are working on a book about locusts uh, that are critical for uh, Central Asia and Caucasus. And we are making it in Russian because most of our uh, people who works in agricultural se uh, sector in Caucasus and Central Asia, they definitely read better Russian than they read uh, English, unfortunately, or whatever. Uh, so I would say that uh, the main uh, works were translated as well as uh, some main English uh, works written in English or in French or whatever, they were translated in, into Russian. So there are translation and exchange, but still to, 
to uh, communicate with people on on field you need um, something like like language they teach in school so yeah thank you anastasia that's great um, we have a couple of other comments here. You know, Fred Ross rightly notes that, you know, Russian science is unfortunately very underrated in the West. He suggests maybe all biologists should study Russian. Not, not the easiest language to pick up in, in, a, in a few months, I wouldn't have said, but still I, I fully agree with him in that respect. Um, I was actually interested in a comment that Derek made in the chat here where people were asking about obviously whether or not you know there's still value in those techniques as Fred Ross notes you know there's a huge amount of value in them they're very labor intensive but obviously very worthwhile I know that from my own um, allied work in this field um, but Derek makes the point it's almost impossible to get the correct microscope these days and I would like to know a little bit more myself sorry because I'm a bit of a nerd as to why that is the case and I wonder if um, Derek could tell us, allowed to talk. There you are, Derek. You're allowed to talk, apparently, since I'm the all-powerful host. If you want to say something, I'd, I'd be delighted to just hear what you have to say. And then we have one further question from Ilana, and then we will probably have to close. So, Derek, please enlighten me, the microscope. Okay, can you hear me? Yep. Uh, well, the the the... The microscope that you one uses is a microscope with a mirror stage. The the light comes through underneath the the, the specimen and through through up through the ovary. And a mirror stage has the advantage that you can both take it to the field where there is no electricity, um, and also that you can sort of as you're doing the dissection, you can. Uh, move the the mirror slightly which will alter the the contrast on the on the on the ovary and so you can sort of see things that you might not otherwise see and now these the bases for these kind of microscopes a, a mirror stage i mean they're just not available they're just not available and they're really really hard to get second hand i'm sure that many um laboratories and on schools of tropical medicine and things have in their cupboards got many of these because of course they were really quite common but i've had great difficulty in in getting um any more than the one that i i no longer have now but um and i got i got one for an old student via the web you know the web but that's it i haven't had any more and have they been superseded by something that's considered to be better or, you know, what happened? Yeah, well, well a, a, a light, a electricity, uh, the, the, the most microscopes now have a, a, a lead light or a, a, a light coming that will come underneath the, 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 the specimen in the same way, but it's a very blanket light. It's not yeah. a, a, a nuanced yeah. light. Yeah. And again, you can't take it to the field. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that was, that was so interesting to me. So we all know what we're doing at the end of this seminar. We're getting through our cupboards and closets down at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine to find those mirror stage um, microscopes pronto. Um, and we're letting Derek know when we find them. So last if you question, would, yeah. If, yeah, seriously, have a look in those closets. I'm sure you'll find something of great worth in there if you bother to look. Okay. Um, so your last question this evening, Anne, after this fantastic seminar is, Alana would like to know, Anne, can you say something about embodied skills? Mm. Your story, which is great, strongly resonated with my own experience in the lab. Oh, that's amazing. Thank you so much, Alana. And again, I, would, I can't wait. I know you're coming to London next week, so I will find a time to talk to you about that. But I think just, I mean, one anecdote um, that Seth Irish, who is another entomologist who I know studied, I think he got some work to work with um, TQ Hawk, who is um, the expert, I think Derek, you mentioned him in the chat as well in Vietnam. And he described um, not being able to drink any coffee before he did these dissections because 
even the slightest tremor um, in the hand would kind of <laughs> pull out um, the mosquito in, you know, it would, it would make the technique unworkable. So I think just, again, I mean, it's thinking about, and I, you know, I, and it's a question for me because at least in the Russian context, what is written about is that age composition, this technique was being used. It was being operationalized in these anti-malarial stations that were widely distributed. And, you know, is it the, is it, you know, <laughs> Soviet hands are stronger? Is it the mosquitoes are bigger? Is it that there is just a different kind of relationship between training? I mean, to me, it's still a really exciting and interesting question. Precisely, you know, how do those techniques move or not? So, you know, I think embodiment is a key part of that story um, and one that you know again the privilege of just knowing and I'm just completely in awe of all of the experts that are here to keep understanding a little bit more about I mean how important those relationships are when we think about kind of tech transfer and techniques and how they how they circulate and how science gets done. Brilliant okay that was absolutely fantastic a lot of um, you know love and appreciation in the chat for the presentation and for all of our three fantastic speakers tonight, um, Anastasia, Joe, and Christos, um, but especially to you, Anne, for that really, really interesting, very innovative and, and over timely overdue presentation on the significance of this very, very important Russian scientist and this fantastic technique that she ushered in. So wonderful talk. Thank you all so much for coming. I hope you all have a wonderful evening. Remember, you can catch up with this talk on YouTube if you want to share it amongst folks who weren't here and I'd like to thank you all very much for taking part and looking forward to your presence at the next in our Age of Health seminars. So thank you all very much and have a fantastic night. Thank you so much everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Yes, thanks.